heard already this morning, but my name is Philza Walters and I'm chairing the session, session 2D, so hopefully you're in the right place. We're going to be talking about reclaimed wood in Southeast Michigan, turning waste into opportunity. And I just wanted to remind everybody, I just checked my time, but my phone is off, so if you could just turn your phones, pages off during the session, out of respect for our speakers and also the attendees here as well. At the end of the session, we will have some time for questions and answers, so it's probably good for you to wait till the end so we can maintain our schedule. Um, just remember, please, both for the speakers and the audience, to, to remember not to use um, names of um, companies or other things like that, just because we want to maintain our um, non-commercialism policy. Um, and then also, thank you, Renee. For the professionals here, we're going to be passing around a sheet here that you can please fill out if you'd like to get the AIA points or the um, GBCI points. And then uh, if you could, um, actually we'll be mailing your certificates. I think they mentioned that in the other sessions to you as well. You'll get them in about 30 days. And then for the students that are here, there's very few students here right now, but if you could again please put your name uh, and also your professor's name so we'll make sure that we tell them that um, you can get extra credit points. Because I'm not giving extra credit points. <laughs> Um, other than that, the only other reminder is we'd love to have one of these filled out for each speaker. So if you're getting a handful of these, there's a reason for it. Um, okay, let's try back here. Um, this is reach. Here, so there you go. If you could get one of these for each speaker, that would be wonderful. We'll collect them at the end. Actually, our, our young helper here will co collect them at the end. So now it gives me the great pleasure of introducing our speakers today. We have two speakers today, Jessica Simon, who is the coordinator of the Urban Wood Project. And Jessica, a little bit of background on you. Um, you coordinate the Urban Wood Project through Recycle Ann Arbor. And you also work with the Southeast Michigan RCND Council, where she has actually managed wood utilization programming since 2004. Jessica previously worked for the USDA Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy. Conservancy. She is a secretary trustee for the Great Lakes Forest Product Society and a member of the Forest Stewardship Council. Jessica has a Master's of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Michigan and a BA in Biology from West Virginia University. At this time, I'll also introduce our second speaker, so I won't take as much time in between. Uh, our second speaker will be Bob Chapman, and Bob is the Executive Director of EcoWorks formerly known as Warm Training Center. Um, Bob has previously been involved in um, energy efficiency, actually has been, um, and sustainability for over 30 years. Since 1996, he's been an executive director of the Detroit-based nonprofit EcoWorks, whose mission is to promote the development of healthy, resource-efficient homes and communities. Bob has served on the boards of the Heat and Warm Fund, which is known to all of us as THAW, the Economic Justice Commission of the Episcopal Diocese, and the City of Detroit's Green Task Force. He's currently a member of the statewide coalition to keep Michigan and Metro Detroit Green Skills Alliance. Um, today's presentation is entitled Reclaiming Wood in Southeast Michigan, Turning Waste into Opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Jessica and then later on Bob. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, I'm actually going to skip right past this one. First of all, it's just a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I, what I'm going to talk about is Recycling wood, and in a way that you may not have really thought about before. And so, throughout the presentation, I want to challenge you to take a good look at this picture here first. Um, I want you to look at the tree on the left and the flooring on the right, and think about that as context for the kind of opportunity that I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. And so, I'll go through a few points throughout the presentation. Um, first off, I will start off talking, um, giving you some facts and figures about the wood that we have available here in Southeast Michigan. Uh, then I'm going to talk about sustainability of local wood products and why that's important from an environmental standpoint and from an economic standpoint. Talk a little bit about the local wood recovery infrastructure, the kinds of businesses that exist here in this part of the state that are doing innovative forestry activities. Talk about some success stories, um, everything from the private sector, the public sector, and everything in between, and then direct you to where you can find some resources and guides to help you out with this idea. So, and I'm going to keep my watch right in front of me here so I don't steal too much of Bob's time. Um, but so, first off, everything really comes back to my involvement in this, this idea and the involvement of so many different organizations and agencies really comes back to a little green bug. It's actually a really tiny green bug, but at the time it seemed like an enormous bug. <laughs> you know, Godzilla-sized bug. Uh, the emerald ash borer was first discovered here in Michigan in 2002. 
And I mean, everybody here familiar with emerald ash borer? You've seen dead and dying trees everywhere, maybe in your own backyard, right? So back in 2002, we first found this bug here and everybody was kind of mobilized. And we had a lot of different agencies, whether that's state, federal, local governments, um, community groups, all of these different people were trying to look at this problem at the same time and figure out what they were gonna do to handle it. How were we gonna get all of these dead and dying trees down safely? How could we restrict the movement of that wood so we don't spread the problem? How, how much is this gonna cost? Who's gonna pay for it? There were so many questions. And on top of everything else, no one really even knew anything about this bug. But I, I got involved in all of this um, in 2004, working for the Southeast Michigan RCND Council. And we partnered with the US Forest Service trying to figure out ways that we could get communities and businesses to work together to find ways to manage all of the wood waste that was coming out of this problem. So we had thousands and thousands of trees dying right in the most urban part of Michigan and we had to figure out what to do with them. So all of a sudden we had a huge forestry problem in the most urban part of the state where people don't really think about forestry problems. People don't really think about the forest industry much here except to think, oh, I don't like how they're cutting trees up north. Um, but people don't really think of forests as something that they live in and among right here in the most metropolitan part of the state. Here, when we manage trees, we have a lot of great urban foresters that are working in southeast Michigan, but we tend to manage the trees for their living value. We plant trees, we water trees, we trim trees, we treat them sometimes when they're, when they're having health issues. We um, we'll worry about removing trees when we have a storm or we have um, you know, something like a pest problem, um, or sometimes even because of building and development. But as soon as we remove the trees, we just want the waste gone. <laughs> we want it cleaned up, we want it off our street, and we don't want to see any evidence of the fact that there was a problem there. And so we, don't, we haven't really thought about that kind of full cycle management um, in the way that we do about so many other resources. So for any of you who happen to be here for Karen's presentation just before, um, we, she talked all about recycling in Michigan. And I thought, this is the best intro ever for my presentation. And then I saw the people walk out and I was like, no, but you need to hear what I need to say. Um, but, but really, this is, this is talking about a recycling effort. This is an urban recycling problem. That we have something that we've treated as waste that we could be treating as a resource. So um, the RCND Council, together with the Forest Service, started um, back in 2005. We wanted to get a handle on how much wood is out there in southeast Michigan. And so com we commissioned a study um, together with a consultant out of, um, out of the Cincinnati area who had some experience with urban trees and together with the MSU Department of Forestry just to figure out, OK, we have municipalities that are removing trees. We have tree care companies that are removing trees. But we also have this huge industrial sector that gets rid of a ton of wood waste from pallets and crates and dunnage and all of these different things. How much wood is this? And is this something we could really think about using in industry? And it turns out it's a lot of wood. <laughs> it's a whole lot of wood. And in fact, it's enough wood to fill a football stadium 10 feet deep, 354 times in a year. That's how much wood that Southeast Michigan generates just from the companies that we surveyed. So this is still a very conservative estimate. But we also wanted to figure out just from the dead and dying trees, so this isn't the crates, this isn't the packaging material, it's nothing from the industrial sector, just from trees, how much are we getting rid of? And is there any quality there? And so the, the team from Michigan State's Department of Forestry sent forestry students who were used to surveying timber out into city streets. And they looked at the trees there. They figured out, are these trees dead and dying? So is there a chance they're going to be removed anyway in the short term? So if the answer was yes, then they looked at trees to figure out, was there any quality there? Like, is this, does it have a decent log that could go to some other higher value? If that answer was yes, then they also said, okay, but can we actually remove the log feasibly? Is it between someone's garage and their clothesline and the dog box and the playhouse? <laughs> and if, if they could actually feasibly get a log out, how much wood are we talking about? And looking at all of those considerations, they still found that there was over 73 million board feet of lumber that could come out of dead and dying trees in southeast Michigan, in urban and suburban areas. So these are not these are not woodlots. These are not um, these are not you know pristine forests up north. This is the trees all among us. 
And would that be enough to do something more with? Absolutely. So if you take the average value of, of board feet that go into building a home, we're talking about 5,600 homes a year that could be built from the trees that will be removed anyway from our local communities. Nationally, this is also a big problem. And so the US Forest Service has really been looking into this for many, many years now. Um, they released a couple of great publications starting in the 90s looking at this problem across the country. And what they found is that if you salvaged usable logs from urban waste streams across the country, it would be enough to supply 25% of our US hardwood consumption in a year. So of all of the wood we use, a quarter of it could be coming out of our communities if we had a better way to get a handle on it and to get it in back into a productive use rather than treat it as waste. So what's limiting that? Why haven't we been doing that? If there's this huge resource, why is no one doing it? And a lot of it really comes down to the same problems you find with recycling with any other resource. The location's tough. You know, navigating a log truck around the city of Detroit is not easy. And so there are plenty of reasons why no one would want to do that. The scale is difficult, so when you're talking about production forestry, you're talking about a forest where the trees have been managed since day one sometimes for their timber value. They're grown in certain ways to make it easy to go in and get marketable trees in one, in one you know, fell swoop. In an urban area, it's exactly the opposite of that. So you have you know, the elm tree that's coming down out of the Jones yard, and then you have three blocks over, three ash trees that are coming out of the Smith yard, and then across town, you know, uh, so on any given day, it's really unpredictable in the amount of wood you're gonna have, the quality of the wood, what the locations are. And so figuring out how to consolidate those resources and make best use, to, use of them is very, very difficult. And then finally, I mean, I think maybe one of the biggest issues is simply that, that factor of people don't want to draw out a process. So when you have a bunch of dying and dead trees on one street, you want them down and out of the way as quickly as possible. And working with other producers, trying to find the best use for it, takes more time. It takes more, more wrangling and more logistical maneuvering to make that happen. And so that can be complicated and difficult, especially at the community scale. But why, what are the benefits? And there are really a lot of benefits. There are some great things that can happen if you can come up with better ways to maximize the value you get from community trees. And so, one, we have better crisis response. Something like emerald ash borer comes in and you have thousands of trees coming out at once. That's an enormous waste disposal problem. And so if we, can, if we can look at that and say, look, we can find ways for you to get value back out of those trees or at very least reduce your cost, that is tremendously helpful in a case where you have a lot of trees that come down at once. The, um, the tornado that hit the little town of Dexter a couple of years ago is a good example of this. Um, you know, suddenly, in, in the matter of an hour, trees were flattened all over town. Well, if you can get people in who can make use of it, you can actually get that wood out more quickly. Um, you can, we can, we're talking about reducing disposal costs for communities. That's a huge, huge bonus to doing this. But supporting local industry, coming up with, helping to support jobs of people who can produce something of value from this local resource is incredibly meaningful in the process. So, <clears throat> Another thing that really goes into this is figuring out, is disposal as it takes place now expensive? And frankly, the answer is just yes. Um, of that survey that we did, looking at wood waste in Michigan, just of the companies that we surveyed, they were spending over almost $9 million a year to dispose of wood waste. So you know, it costs money to have people truck away something that you don't want if there's no market for it. So instead, we're talking about how can we line up industries to, to work with the people who have the resource and do it in a way so that we can get rid of these disposal costs. So the other big question too is where is all the wood going? And so we did a follow-up study um, together again with Michigan State's Department of Forestry just trying to figure out where is all of this wood landing in, in Southeast Michigan? And it turns out that there are about 180 disposal yards throughout, throughout this corner of the state. And some of them are big and flashy and formal and a lot of stuff happens there. And some of them are simply a field where wood is dumped. <laughs> and so um, we did an extensive survey as part of this, trying to talk to the people managing these yards and figuring out, well, what are they doing with it? Are they turning it into products? Are they making something else out of this wood? Are they, is there some economic benefit coming out of it? And we found that the industry as it stands right now is a $40 million industry in just this corner of the state, just collecting wood waste. 
but that only 30% of the wood that goes into those yards is actually turned into another product. So 70% of the material that they take in ends up just sitting there. And I'm, I'm in any other product, I, sh I should clarify that. So I mean, that's including mulch, that's including firewood, that's in including fuel. Only 30% of it even gets turned into lower value uses. So 70% of it is literally just sitting there. <coughs> It also has, you know, we can talk about the local benefits of, you know, the warm and fuzzy things. We can lower disposal costs, we can support local industry, but even from a big picture environmental standpoint, this is meaningful. So a really interesting study was done just a couple of years ago um, by a nonprofit group called Dovetail Partners. They're out of Minneapolis. And what they looked at, they wanted to figure out with, with so much interest now in reducing a carbon footprint, what would using this wood locally mean? And because it makes sense from a carbon standpoint if you think about just locality. If you're buying local wood that was grown right in your yard versus buying you know, a, an environmentally friendly bamboo product that was made in China. You know, buying local always makes more sense from a carbon standpoint, right? But sequestration is really important from a carbon standpoint. So if you have a tree that grew on your street and you chop it up into mulch that decomposes, that carbon is released again, right? If you burn that wood, that carbon is released again. But if you actually keep it as a solid wood product, every bit of carbon that was stored by that tree, still there, right? As long as you have that table in your house or as long as you have that bench that you sit on, that carbon is still locked up. And so, you know, when you're talking on a tree by tree basis, it's not that meaningful. But the study that they did looked at if we assumed that communities removed 1% of their trees every year, and if we assumed that 10% of those had some value in it, and so these were pretty conservative assumptions, but I think pretty realistic ones. If 10% of those trees could be turned into solid wood products, and we did that every year for 30 years in this country, it would be the same as removing 723,000 cars from our streets, just by using urban trees for their solid wood value. So this probably looks like a jumble of nothing from the back especially, but. I also wanted to just kind of give you an idea of what this can mean from an economic standpoint in a city. So this is a case study, again, that Dovetail Partners did. And they looked in the city of Minneapolis. And um, even seeing what these say isn't that important as kind of looking at the figures here. Up at the top, we have a tree service firm and a company that, that mills wood products. And so what's neat is they have this whole cluster going in Minneapolis where wood is being used at its highest and best value. And so wood removed by the tree service firm is immediately split up and sent three different ways. The high value stuff is sent to a sawmill company. The lower value stuff that is still millable goes to a pallet manufacturer. And then the really low value stuff goes to a group called Environmental Wood Supply that, that, that actually takes all of that wood and, and turns it into fuel products. So we have low value stuff that's going to a district energy plant. We have intermediate stuff that's going to pallets. And then the high value stuff is going to custom sawyers, it's going to secondary manufacturers, it's going to green building supplies, it's eventually getting down to grocery store co-ops and to gift shops. So you can see how many different businesses that are all involved in salvaging wood out of a municipality. And this is fantastic. I mean, they really are using it every bit at its highest and best use. So you have you have city trees that are being turned into, you know, into cutting boards and into picture frames, but then you have city trees that are literally going to produce energy right in that city. And it's all staying local, supporting these local businesses. In Michigan, we, believe it or not, we have a lot of this infrastructure in place already. So we have these businesses that are using wood at a lot of different levels. What we don't have is a, um, is a steady high value supply stream. So it's building, we're getting there on it. But right now, and we have, oh, unfortunately the top of the picture is a little cut off. But if you start all the way in the upper corner, you know, we have communities that are just removing their own trees, right? We also have tree care companies that are either removing city trees or removing landowner trees. And so that's where it all starts. You have this wood that's being generated. And from there, we have a couple of different pathways. And so some of it ends up, if you go to the top middle here, some of it ends up going to those kind of collection yards where sometimes it is sorted out and higher value stuff goes one way and lower value stuff goes another. Sometimes it just goes straight into a grinder where, and that happens often right at those collection yards where it can come, become mulch or it can go straight to a, a fuel plant. And we have one of those in Flint that is turning local wood waste into, into energy. 
But then sometimes we have the firewood industry picking it up. Unfortunately, some of it is still going into landfills too. So that is another pathway that we really want to avoid. Um, and, and it's tricky how that happens. Um, Michigan technically has a law that, that bans green waste in landfills unless it's wood that is chipped used as daily cover. So that's really a way around it. You can't throw a log into a landfill. If you grind it and use it to cover up all of the trash, you can put the log in the landfill <laughs> and it happens every day. And so, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't followed the landfill industry enough to know if there's some alternative to daily cover that they could be using other than wood, but I don't think that's the best use of our wood. Now down in the corner, what you have is that another option for those city or landowner trees is to actually be, is to have the logs separated. And those logs can go to local sawmills. And believe it or not, there are sawmills all over Southeast Michigan that are milling urban trees and turning those into high value products. And so at this point, I really wanna talk about some of those success stories right here in Michigan. Um, there's, there's a really partnership that has evolved between several local businesses and several local nonprofits. And so they're doing just that high value part that I was talking about. They're salvaging logs straight from tree care companies. They are, they're working, they're trying to find the best value ones, turning those into lumber and other products and selling them in nonprofit restores. And so there are several of these throughout the state. And what's really interesting about those is that the wood that you see sold in those stores is very different than what you'll see at kind of the commodity big box store. It's really the equivalent of going to big chain grocery store versus the farmer's market. You know, the farmer's market is selling local products from local farmers where they can really sell unusual different things that appeal to a certain kind of customer. And that's exactly what we've seen from these wood stores, that they're not just selling pine two by fours. They're selling every species that is removed from our local communities. So you can have 30 different species at once and that those, they're representing a lot of different things. You'll see clear lumber and so, you know, kind of the more traditional idea of what you see as lumber, but then also really weird stuff that, that the, the major forest products industry traditionally thought of as junk. When the big, when the, the big um, forest products companies are, when they're doing their logging operations, if wood has holes in it or stains in it or markings of other kind, it doesn't meet that commodity standard. It doesn't meet the grades that they've established to make everything easily sortable. Instead, that gets a job and that gets turned into firewood. And what we found is there really is demand from woodworkers to find really unusual stuff. The stuff that has a ton of character, the stuff that has markings and holes that would have been thrown in someone's fireplace before. And another wonderful example of this is what happened in the city of Flint recently. Um, the city of Flint has really been struggling. And one of the ways that the city had cut back was cutting back their forestry operations. So for the entire city of Flint, they had two staff members who were trying to manage all forestry activities. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Luckily, the local conservation district was able to leverage grants from a lot of different sources to help them out with their forestry work. And so they conducted inventories, trying to identify hazard trees. They helped them with removals. They, um, you know, they're trying to find all these ways to help support the forestry efforts. But one of the things they did is they started working with local sawmills so they could salvage logs from flint hazard tree removals, the most dangerous of dangerous trees that are needed to come down, and actually turning those into products that are sold with the funds going back in to support the city's forestry efforts. So it's a really innovative opportunity that has come up. But what's neat is we're seeing interesting case studies pop up everywhere. So, I mean, the city of Gross Point Park is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from Flint. But they have a wonderful, um, wonderful city forester who's been really innovative. And so he has been working with, they, they contract out their tree removals and they contract them out to a company that has a sawmill. And so as trees come down in the city, that, that wood is milled and it's turned right back into products. So this is the same picture that was on that very first slide. So as ash trees and elm trees were dying off all throughout the city and they needed new flooring in different city buildings, they made flooring from their own trees. Even the lower value stuff, um, they would, you know, they'd mill it and it would go into barriers around some of their recreation fields, different things, e and all the way down to they were using mulch from the city trees right around their city plantings. And so trying to think uh, down that whole scale of the different ways they could use wood. Ann Arbor's Traver Wood Library is another great example of this. Um, just a few years ago, they were building a new library on the north end of town. 
they were really committed to green building and wanted to use responsible materials as often as they could. And um, the site that they were building on happened to be covered in dead ash trees. <laughs> and so they harvested those trees and actually used those as design features in the new building. So you can see here, these are all ash trees right off of the property where that building was built. And um, the building got so much attention, it was featured in Architect Magazine. There was an, a wonderful PBS hour-long documentary that was done on it. And so um, it's a great story of how that wood can really be used locally. And there are a lot of private companies that have really jumped on this as well, and um, they're doing some really interesting things. I mean, and what's nice is that it's moving through the marketplace. And so there are businesses in the Chicago area in particular that have managed to get urban wood products from salvaged Chicago trees in, for instance, very large coffee shops that exist across the country and, you know, high-end design stores that are all starting to carry this sort of thing. And one example I have up here, um, it doesn't show up all that well, unfortunately, um, on the screen, but Penn State University had, has an innovative project going where they have a lot of trees that are dying on campus. They've been salvaging those trees and turning them into products that they market to alumni. And so think about it, if, you, you know, if you're passionate about the school that you went to, you could actually have a product made from the trees that you once studied under. But what's nice is there are also examples of how this can go kind of the full spectrum. And so on Oakland University's campus, they, were, um, they have a clean energy research center where they're demonstrating a lot of different energy technologies. And one of the ones they really were passionate about focusing on was wood because they knew that there was low value wood that's being generated in the area that isn't really all captured yet. And so just a couple of years ago, they installed a wood boiler system. It's a very high tech system. It has great um, air quality scrubber mechanisms that, uh, that reduce the emissions problems. And this kind of technology really has not been demonstrated much in Michigan. And it's really taking off in Europe. There are a lot of European um, countries that really, um, they, they rely on wood biomass energy. And so Oakland University is demonstrating this. And they're, by their projections, they're, they're estimating that they're gonna save about $50,000 a year in fuel costs by using local wood to fuel this building. Um, finally, I just want to present a couple of resources, and I'm going to do that very quickly because um, I know I'm kind of going through time here. But the Southeast Michigan RCD Council has a website for the Ash Utilization Options Project. And if you just search RCD Ash, I'm sure you'll find it. But um, there's, it's a great resource for kind of showcasing some of these different projects, leading to different resources that you can find, different published studies on using wood. Dovetail Partners, as I mentioned a couple of times, they're, um, they're a nonprofit out of Minneapolis that's done tremendous research on wood and responsible materials. And so if you have questions about urban wood, but also if you have questions about what does FSC mean versus SFI versus all of these different wood certifications that start to seem like alphabet soup, it's a good place to go. They have, they have really quality reports on evaluating those. MichiganWoodEnergy.org is another website where you can explore wood as an energy option, and so there are a lot of reports and resources on there, including a calculator that facility managers can use to actually gauge what their fuel costs would be if they switch to wood versus using other fuel types. And then finally, there's a group called the Urban Forest Products Alliance. Um, and this, it simply exists as a LinkedIn uh, community group on there, but it's a wonderful discussion point. There are like 800 members nationwide that all are on there exchanging stories about how communities can make better use of their wood. So that's another one I'd encourage you to check out. And finally, I think, are we doing questions all the way at the end? I think so. Okay. All right. work on this right here like um, uh, so in line with what I'm about to, to, to present to you and, and again we're talking about wood uh, we're just talking about uh, wood that's already been used once um, uh, I'm Bob Chapman with the executive director of for the first time I'm saying EcoWorks yesterday uh, after 31 years of being warm training center our training center changed its name to EcoWorks to better reflect what we do, uh, and not just training. So I'm probably going to be putting at least a dollar into the uh, jar <laughs> that every time I say warm when I'm supposed to say EcoWorks, it's, it's, uh, we're going to have to start doing this. So uh, uh, we have a problem that we think is really an opportunity. Um, uh, there's estimated as many as 70,000 abandoned structures in the city. Um, and uh, it's been uh, said that 
uh, the, the virgin forest, the, the original timbers, are, are still standing. It's just that they're standing in our houses. And uh, if, if you um, have houses that were built and are no longer habitable, of course, if they are habitable, you'd want to restore them. But if they're no longer habitable, the question is then, what do you do with them? Uh, and um, we're committed to the idea that you don't throw away, we're not going to throw away Detroit, and we're not going to throw away Detroiters. So we're going to uh, see if we can turn this into the opportunities for job creation, for products, for things about value added. We're, uh, all of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the triple bottom line. I'm just, by the way, going to pass this around and you can just start, take a look at it and then it'll go through as we go through. One of the things as you look at this, it's a, um, a business card holder that we, we gave as a giveaway to our breakfast yesterday. Take a look at the growth lines. Take a look at the lines in there. Now come back to that. All of you are familiar, I know, with the, the idea of a triple bottom line approach. Uh, for us, it's approach to business. So we're talking about something that uh, it's not enough if you're going to deal with something from a, from a you've got a quote-unquote problem. Even if you have a quote-unquote opportunity, it isn't enough that we talk about something being an economic, um, we're not satisfied saying let's make an economic case of this. Uh, we obviously want, again, a, a way that you've all seen this, that the, the sweet spot here is sustainable development, right? It's not enough that, um, uh, that it's, I got an economic impact. Uh, it's not really enough that it just has a social impact because is it sustainable? Will that keep on going? And of course, we've got to get away from this either or thinking that says either we can have a healthy economy or we can have a healthy environment. You know, we've got to just start reframing the issues in a both and, and we have to reframe the questions in a both and. And, and let me suggest to you that we, we've got to stop getting um, trapped in uh, letting somebody else define the issue and define the problem. Because if they define it, then you're, you're stuck with their premises. Um, we're, we're saying, no, it's going to be a both and situation. It's not going to be an either or situation. So the, the, the solution for us was if we have houses that were no longer going to be viable, and Detroit has you know, you all know Detroit had two million people in 1950 and we're around 700,000 now. Um, uh, you can fit San Francisco, um, Manhattan, and Boston inside the city limits uh, of Detroit and still have room left over. Uh, if, if we've got to go to a different land use idea and a different configuration, if we go to more of a city of villages, if we have concentrations, where we build on our strengths and we build on our assets, then that's going to still mean then that there's some housing that is going to need to come down um, because people aren't going to live in that housing uh, and, and or it's deteriorated to the point where it can't be uh, in any way, shape, or form in, uh, uh, economically salvaged. But what can be done? What we can do is take things down and start doing part of uh, what we call, what's called deconstruction. And, uh, and starting with taking a house down purposefully, planfully, safely, uh, understanding what we're doing about it and how to go about it. T taking those products, that, the, the, the flooring, taking the wood lath, taking, which I never thought there would be a, we'd be able to economically find a, use for a wood lath, but we're finding one. Um, taking the floor joists, taking the roof rafters. We're ambitious. There's a lot of places, uh, you know, that they're, they're around the country there are places that have been doing some of this work and they call it deconstruction. It, it's often, um, you, you're forced into what's was called of a skimming. In other words, the floor, the architectural details, it's got, a, uh, you know, it's got uh, mantles, it's got crown molding. Some of those things have a, a very high turnaround and somebody could take it out and sell it. But uh, we say, no, we need to be going for all of it. You know, my goal is that no more than a hefty bag goes to a trash, to, to the landfill. Um, that's very ambitious and we're gonna get to the economics of that in just a second. So, <clears throat> what you saw here then goes 
to a, both a warehouse and a mill operation that then takes that wood and, and starts turning it into something with value of a value added. And this for uh, the business people and what we need, this is a, a social business, it's a business. And so whether from an engineering standpoint, there's so many entries into this whole thing that it just, it's really amazing. Um, for whether the designers, uh, engineers, architects, um, there, there are so many people, so many professions that could bring to bear their creativity on this problem slash opportunity. So in this case, uh, on a small scale, we're, ta we're taking uh, wood and turning it into some products, but uh, the, what's really happening is that we're providing the raw materials for people to do amazing things. We're, we're, we're providing the materials that somebody else an artist, a furniture maker, um, a designer, a builder will take and do, and in this case, uh, th some of you may have seen the story about the uh, Kresge Arts Grants that came out of just a little while ago. And one of the people who got that uh, art, art grant um, was, is, is making guitars out of reclaimed wood and is, is using um, some products that we've taken out of some Detroit houses um, to, to make an ele electronic guitars. None of us here probably could afford the guitar that this guy's <laughs> making, but it's gorgeous. Um, so what can you get if you really try to do a true deconstruction industry? And we don't yet have, we've got a fledgling industry. Um, it's so much in line, though, with what you were saying in, in every way about that. In fact, that one slide that people can't read but is just gorgeous, that slide, I may want to just see if I can, that dovetail, I'm going to look up dovetail because that was great, Jessica. Um, the, the idea is you start with the house and you end with something like this. I mean, that's pretty amazing. But, but to, and, and you get it all. You get the reuse, you get the blight reduction, you get jobs created. It's estimated that in between one and eight, I mean, sorry, six to eight jobs created in deconstruction for every one job that's just demolition. Um, and that does not count the secondary jobs. That doesn't count the person making something with this. That just counts the, the actual deconstruction process. Um, uh, I almost did it again. I almost spent it. Ah. EcoWorks. Uh, last year, we, we paid out uh, over $600,000 in wages to uh, Detroiters who were um, then supporting their family and paying taxes um, and making a living wage um, in deconstructing houses. So is there a difference between demolition, economic difference between demolition and deconstruction? The answer is Yes, and most of that money is going straight into wages, which what? Stays in the local economy, has that multiplier effect. Um, there's a compelling um, economic case to be made for uh, uh, governmental, uh, federal or state uh, uh, incentive to help build this industry. Just like we built the transportation industry, and, uh, and, and then the car manufacturers benefited by that, and we built the airports and the plane manufacturers benefited by that and we all did as consumers. Uh, this is another industry and in a lot of ways it very much, and I'm glad again, Jessica, you mentioned the recycling, because in a lot of ways this is very, it's part of that whole recycling idea. Are we going to be still being a throwaway culture or are we going to try to reclaim and reuse? And this is another aspect, deconstruction is taking houses and taking that same ethos. Um, is it often cheaper to just throw things away? We all know it is. But cheaper in the long run? Uh, may maybe not so much. Um, the, who uses the deconstructed materials? Uh, you have the, the DIY, the do-it-yourselfers, so property owners, you have people involved with remodeling uh, who say maybe want lumber that's from the generation or the years that that, that house was built. Uh, you have architects, engineers, design professionals uh, who are using it 
Um, and for those of you who are into uh, uh, lead, you know that you can get lead points for uh, using uh, reclaimed materials. Um, so general contractors get in on that and, and uh, cities and local governments are starting to understand uh, a little bit more the value of, of maintaining some of their history or reusing some of their history. So the materials, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a few more that are not on here. I think I did get them on to, yeah, I didn't get them on to here. And if, and, and if I've got to go through those other ones really fast, because am I allowed to name pro restaurants or any place that have used it or no? Somebody tell me that I can or can't. This is not a trade name kind of thing, but it's just like, where does this stuff get used? I guess I've, I've been really struck by the creativity. Um, it's like the, the, the aesthetics and the beauty that people have found in using these materials is, is really striking. Because if you remember that first slide of that poor little orphaned house, and to turn it into something gorgeous is uh, a pretty amazing uh, transformation. And it, it can be done. I mean, it's places like um, uh, park benches. It's things like uh, 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 wood grain on, on um, uh, uh, tables and, and on um, um, uh, uh, flooring and this cloud above in roofing and, and ceilings and uh, uh, architectural features. It's architects and designers are pretty, um, um, can be very creative people. If they don't get too caught up in just accumulating lead points, but when they're really trying to do it right. Um, by the way, this is another way that we're solving triple bottom line kinds of solving problems. Um, the the, the uh, Detroit's environmental agenda uh, has stressed the idea of adopting a city waste management policy. <clears throat> For those of you who have heard of Detroit Future City, and if you haven't, I, I imagine most of you have, but if you haven't, just Google it. It's really amazing. I think it will be the blueprint for the revitalization of the city and even the region. Uh, it's the future of these next 50 to 75 years, I think. Detroit Future City also suggests that part of the jobs and the, that, that, can, that can be created within the city um, will come from a thriving deconstruction industry. Now, I guess I, I don't want to paint, though, a rosy picture. Um, if this was easy, it would have been done. If this was easy, it would have been done a long time ago. Um, the, in some ways, we've had a deconstruction and reuse industry for a long time under the underground. It's called scrapping. And it's uh, where people have just gone into houses that have been, where people have moved out of houses or been foreclosed on. And you go back even as soon as like a month later, and that house has the windows gone, and the copper's been removed, and if the water hadn't been shut off, the basement is now flooded, and the uh, uh, holes have been uh, pounded into walls, and all the uh, wiring has been ripped out. And at that point, that house, which someone might have looked at and said, that house would be, I want to, that could be remodeled. That house now has zero economic benefit at all. That happens like that. That happens in some cases. I've talked to people who have seen the house across the street from them happen. The people moved out. They were foreclosed. So they were forced out of the house. And within weeks, that house was rendered um, useless. That house was rendered in a, um, and that's scrapping. In a way, what we want to do is say, you know, We've got to be, have a concerted policy, a coordinated policy, where the city and the county is saying, if a house is going to be foreclosed upon, it's got to be protected. It's got to be um, properly boarded up. Then there has to be a policy to uh, look at that house and make an, a determination if it's going to be just given over to taxes and now the city or the county owns it. What's going to happen to it? Those 70,000 abandoned structures and the headlines you're going to see this week about all the blight reduction money that's coming into the city, for the most part, for most people in positions of power, they, by blight reduction, they mean demolition. And if that's all that happens in the next five years, in the next three years, you're going to see 
all those houses, pushed down with a front loader, picked up, put into a semi truck, taken out to Western Wayne County and dumped in a landfill. Because that's where all that goes. There, I didn't even know there was a rule about the, about the housing, about logs can't be put in landfills. But I can tell you, there ain't no rule about housing because that's where it goes. In fact, construction waste, new construction as well as demolition, is the single biggest, um, uh, by volume, single biggest um, uh, occupier of landfills. It ain't Pampers. Somebody started that a long time ago. It's not diapers. It's construction waste. Um, we're saying, now, does everything need to be uh, uh, deconstructed? No, there's a lot of things that, uh, at this stage of the game, there's a lot of things that there's no way you can economically make that business case. But we need smart business people. We need people, we need people who understand merchandising, we need under who understand supply chains. The industry, two months ago, we sent a flatbed trailer full of reclaimed wood to Chicago, who bought it, paid us $10,000 for this wood because they had a demand for it and they didn't have the houses. They didn't have the lumber. Because in Chicago, the economics are a little different and people want reclaimed lumber, but uh, they didn't have it. And we had it and sold it to them. Now, we have a supply issue and I'm not gonna get into all of that. Challenges. There's not very much government support at this. Most of the government support is blight reduction. And personally, it's, um, and somebody's watched me on time here. I'm trying to talk fast so that we have time for questions. Thanks. Um, it's all get it down. And it's personally like a little galling to me where we have conversations and it's like, well, deconstruction, isn't that going to take longer? How long do you stand on site? You know, because it'll take us maybe 10 days to take a house down as opposed to, you know, uh, ha half a day for demolition. Um, and I'm like, you've let that house sit there for 25 years and now I'm holding up the train? Come on. That, w w w but suddenly it's push, push, push. Suddenly it's everything. It's like, oh, it's got to come down right away. It's got to come down right away after it sat there for 25 years. Um, but there's not as much government support. There are individuals, but there's not much right now. Low tipping fees. Does anybody know what a tipping fee is? Or <clears throat> tipping fee is when you take a dumpster to a landfill um, how much does it cost you to dump that whole semi truck into the hole? Michigan has, in, in Wayne County, there's some pretty low tipping fees. So it's pretty cheap to throw stuff away. That's part of the economics, part of what happened with recycling. When it was really cheap to throw stuff away, then it's really hard to make the business case for reclaiming. When it's not cheap to throw things away, and you go to California and you got a lot higher tipping fees, then the economics suddenly get a little bit better and a little, it levels the playing field a little bit more. So those are policy decisions. Those are policy decisions. Uh, hell, if you just put a tax on that stuff, you would generate revenue and you would help the deconstruction industry and that could generate jobs. If that thing was just, if those were just even taxed more. Um, uh, we have to create more of a demand and understanding of true value. Sometimes people come into whether it's Ypsilanti or Ann Arbor uh, and people are looking for cheap wood. They just want cheap wood. We're not trying to market ourselves to compete against the Home Depots or the Lowe's of the world. It took way too much effort to take that and that lumber, that real two by four, uh, that's really two inches by four inches, um, that is not uh, of the same uh, quality of that cheap southern pine that's got growth rings about this much far apart and you saw what the growth rings were there. Uh, I'm not going to get into it right now, but there's also a lot of things that you don't want to try to use deconstructed wood for. I mean, some of that stuff can get so hard because over time it's aged that um, it's not like you want to just buy it and start th putting nails into it because you're going to bend a lot of nails. So there's uses for deconstructed wood. I think especially, again, with the design community, in art, in furniture making, in um, picture frames, things like that, it's a value added thing. Um, but we have to create more demand and get that word out there that there even is. We've had a lot of architects come to us who say, I didn't know we could get this stuff. I would have spec'd it. I would have put it into the, uh, my, the plans, but I didn't know that there was a supply and I can't spec something. And if I don't know that the uh, general contractor can go out and buy it, they can get it for that project. 
So this is something we're learning and we're trying to understand what does that mean to bring something to scale. Um, and, and frankly, that goes beyond my pay grade. We need <laughs> smart people who understand those issues better to help build this industry and get involved in this industry. Um, and we're going to need better outlets. Uh, we have a, a, a store that we're creating a walkable warehouse at Focus Hope, whom some of you may know. We lease two warehouses at Focus Hope. There's, some of you may have heard of the Architectural Salvage Warehouse that's in Detroit. Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor have places, but we need uh, a shoppable warehouse. I mean like the equivalent of a Home Depot, except for reclaimed materials. And you know that probably will go back to government and foundation support. Well, we're gonna need help to get the right location because you can't just bootstrap this thing. Um, there are so many issues here that what I really wanted to do was throw some of this out to you and I'm so grateful to have gone after Jessica because some of the issues that she raised are like right in line with what I did. So I'm gonna stop there and we have a couple of minutes for questions. For Jessica or for Bob. <coughs> yes, okay. Israel. Um, is there like a uh, where would we get like a list I guess of, of contacts or suppliers of this reclaimed wood? Is there like one place you could go to get? Sure. For, in terms of where do you go to find where there might be reclaimed wood? There is a, at the national level, even that's a fledgling thing. There is a building material reuse as association, but it's very fledgling. It's not by any means comprehensive. In, in southeast Michigan, basically, EcoWorks, I almost did it again, yeah. uh, is one of the few organizations that's actually taking down structures. But for reclaimed wood in general, Ypsilanti has, somebody help me with the name of that. Um, uh, oh, I'm just blanking on their name. Um, uh, tre something Unlimited? Oh, I'm sorry. There's one in Ypsilanti. There's one in Ann Arbor. There's, uh, you do have to look under Warm Training Center or Reclaim Detroit. We're branding our section of EcoWorks as Reclaim Detroit. And, uh, and we're trying to grow that industry. But it's really a thing. There's not a lot of where you're actually going to be able to get l lumber or wood. And I, if, if I can speak on the, the more of the urban trees aspect mm -hmm. of uh, products from that, um, I'm with the Urban Wood Project. So if you just go to urbanwood.org, you'll be able to find all the partners associated with that. And I mean, there are like seven local producers in Southeast Michigan that are part of that project. But honestly, if you just um, if you just Google for urban wood, you'll find other small producers. Um, and there are even a few in Southeast Michigan that aren't affiliated with our project that are just working independently as well. Um, and it's just like Bob said, it's a fledgling industry. So there aren't, you know, there aren't great national directories for that, but there are groups that are trying to make that happen. We have a question up here and one back there and then another one here. Thank you. So just briefly, uh, at the advocacy side, uh, I mean, you just, like, there's a big opportunity coming up in Detroit, and yet maybe people aren't reading the tea leaves correctly. Uh, who, I mean, where do you go in terms of try? I mean, who are some of the partners, I suppose, in terms of advocacy? And, and, and the touchstones, either in D.C. or in Lansing or in the city, um, to make this a I, I think it's, you know, it's a good question, Charles. I, you know, it's, it's, you start where you are. So different cities could be specking in, for example, diversion. So if cities, when they were saying blight reduction, if they, if they pushed for that, so if, if, if where your angle is is sort of policy and government, there's an angle there to help grow this industry. But architects and developers, people that are involved in the project, if they're specking it in, if they're saying, you ought to do this, and believe me, there's a lot of, um, it's a cool thing now. I mean, now you have owners, you know, the coffee shop owners and the, uh, the theater owners and the people that are, dan dan uh, the, some, I was about to use another trade name, that there's people who, <laughs> there's somebody who owns about 17 buildings downtown who is supporting that and wanting to, and has bought some of our product. If you let somebody, if you know that they're being used and you say, that's cool, I'm glad you're using it. I think there's a lot of ways that this, we've got to just say, stop throwing things away. I, I guess I want to ally ourselves with the entire idea of recycling and including that with urban woods, whether it's trees or other things. Thank you. We had a question back there. Um, 
you mentioned that they, that you were able to pay six hundred thousand dollars in wages. I'm cons I'm uh, interested in knowing what skills do the de constructors need. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we we do do some specific job training um, about uh, that so that people get a good sense of of um, understanding uh, how a house is built. Uh, our, one of our goals in, in EcoWorks is that we, for any training that we do, it's not a one, nobody becomes a one trick pony, that they can get a skill but they have enough theory to go beyond. So they get construction, some understanding of how a house is constructed. And there is some um, uh, specific uh, deconstruction training or if somebody had some training in just construction trades. That, that would be enough, but we really stress safety. N people already, when they come on our site, they, if we've trained them, they have myosha, they have lead safe awareness, um, uh, they have first aid, um, the, the, and, and, and basically, and above all, you understand what the phrase load bearing means. <laughs> but thank you, yeah, that training is a very important aspect of that. I have a couple questions back. Yeah, if, um, our, like our church may tain on some big trees in Boonville Hills. Uh, is there someone we can contact? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we um, kind of, so there are so many parallels between what Bob's saying and what we're doing. And it's, there is the point that not every tree is suitable. And the first conversation you need to have is that wh with whoever is you're contracting to take down a tree, you'd say, what's happening to this wood afterwards? Do you work with anybody who can reclaim logs? Because for instance, the, the partners that I work with are sawmills for the most part. They don't, they're not loggers. They don't come out and take a tree down and take it away and mill it. Instead, they salvage logs, like a recycling operation, from others who do the tree removal. And so the first conversation is with whoever is removing the tree, just saying, hey, I'd love to see this wood go to another use. Have you heard of the people, you know, is there a way that you can get this log to someone who will use it for something else? And if you have questions about that, you're always welcome to contact me, and I can help put you in touch with people who do that kind of work. Okay. Thank you. Are you getting prepared for the Longhorn people? Uh, you know what, and that's, that's an, I'm glad you brought that up because the Emerald Ash Borer got us started. It's what got people thinking about, hey, a lot of trees are being removed, what happens to this? But the fact that the matter is that it's an ongoing problem. If it's not Emerald Ash Borer, then it's a, a tornado that comes through, or it's the next forest health problem, or you know, there's some, some blight that's happening on trees, so there's always something. Um, and the, the ideal is to have enough inf infrastructure in place that you can handle whatever the next problem is as it comes along. So that's going to take out the now, maple tree? Unfortunately, with the Asian longhorn beetle, it's, I mean, any forest pest like this is bad news. Emerald ash borer happily doesn't devalue the wood. It just kills the tree, but the wood stays intact. Asian longhorn beetle, on the other hand, bores all the way through the tree and just makes a mess of it. So um, there won't be as, a, as many economic opportunities because of ALB, if it shows up here, as there were with the AB. It is 12.06, and I know lunch is starting at 12.05. It's back up uh, by registration.